Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Magadan Lover. And right now, we're doing Keeping the Past Alive. Now, as you can see, we wanted to go to war with the Muir last time, but apparently, Cheetah was so fast, so quick, that they took out a Muir by themselves. Go figure, which made this focus auto bypass. So we can't do this one. We couldn't do this one, which sucks, but oh well. So we're doing Keeping the Past Alive. The Russian F parties won. Men who are enemies for decades now embrace one another in the spirit of brotherhood that connects one Russian to another. Hands that turn to guns, knives, and rifles in the olden days now clasp one another in unity and friendship, bringing no ill will to one another. The days of the split are behind us as all the members of the party agree to join Mikoski in his holy crusade, the liberation of Russia from ruin and suffering. However, in the Far East, there are still enemies that lurk in the background. The Reds in Irkutsk and Berakti have settled their own schism and are preparing to retake their former territories. Further east, the Tsar still held Cheetah, an unwilling monarch kept in his gilded cage. Meanwhile, rumors have spread to our lands, telling of a father from the northern parts of Siberia. They shall fall, all fall, for the RFP now marches, not as two, but one. Which does suck that we didn't get any of this, but we you know, whatever. And we still don't have any motorized, which sucks. But, oh well, it is what it is. Oh, hello. Well, I guess we're going in. Go on in, guys. If we can get all the way down here, that'd be great. Don't worry. Just go down there. And you are slowly winning, which I'm a little surprised, but I'm pleased about. Especially infantry on infantry division. Uh, I guess we do have some support equipment. Like, that does help. Oh, hello. Keeping them pass alive? Well, do the best you can, I suppose. Can we actually win there? New Frontiers. Mikowski is in the room, telling his bodyguard to stay at the door. It was wanted to do this. He had entered Rozhevsky's office, home to, to the files of almost every or all current and former RFP members. He chuckled. He'd never taken the banner king for uh, the Far East to be much, uh, or such a meticulous and attentive person. He looked around the room. Alcohol, drugs, coffee, every substance of comfort crowded at the lone desk perched on the far end of the room, in the front of the open windows. The afternoon sun's faint light filtered into or filtered in the room, and the glasses of Rozhevsky's excess glimmered like gems or gems against the backdrop of the steel gray sky. Covering his nose, through the rank smell, reached a drawer and pulled out a file. M section. And Mikowski Mikhail, his photo, young and handsome, ooh, grace a file. Its pages were surprisingly clean, tidily typed. At first glance, it could pass for a well-written letter. The contents and notes of it stood in contrast to its exterior. Long run-on sentences cursed Mikowski in a phrase to his eye, kosher fascist. Mikowski smiled, never change, old friend, never change. Uh, and all that remained then was a compiled list. Though most of the RFPs were Russians, Minkowski wing of the party could not accept Rozhevsky's without some adjustments. Some would follow the fate of their master. Some would be free to find their fortunes in the waste of Siberia. Some would be the RFP's prodigious children. Wayward sons of Russia who lost their way. All would serve Minkowski. He, stood, he looked out. Past the windows. After Siberia. Russia itself. The very pictures of ambition. Our way forward. The madman of Amur is no more. The infamous band king, the former leader of the RFP, Konstantin Rozhevsky, is dead. Now that split in the party has been mended and our rule has been secured, we are ready to look beyond inter-party squabbles to the rest of the eastern, far eastern region. In her absence, many powers have seized territory for themselves, the Tsars and Cheetah, the regional republics of Yakutia and Aldan, the Reds and Irkutsk and Bratia, and last but not least, the so-called father consolidating his power in the north. How unlucky for them, then. The party is now one, with a sole head helming it. We'll form a united front, one that we have not made with our brothers in Numur for years, to roll back the warlords of the Far East and establish ourselves as a single legitimate representative of a Russian state there. The crusade begins here, and from out, here on out, there is nowhere for us to go but up. I'll turn the deal. During the harsh times, or times of harsh winters, we formed a temporary truce with the Tsars to work against Rajevsky before that, during the years of the Union's collapse. We united with them to create the anti-Bolshevik front. The alliance was successful up to a point. The front fell into infighting, with the Tsars splitting away and taking charge of Cheetah, led by the late Semenyanov. Meanwhile, the RFP became entrenched in Magadan and Amur before undergoing its own split. Now the parties had sorted through its struggles and ended the division. It's ready to turn to the outside world. The Tsars and Cheetah seem to be the most appropriate targets for the target or start of our expansion. Having worked with them, we know their strengths and weaknesses, giving us an upper hand in a hypothetical conflict between the monarchists of the party. We shall alter the deal. Either they serve us or die in defiance. They can either be one leader, and that will be Mudkovsky. I'm surprised these guys are doing relatively okay against normal infantry. Of course, now we have normal infantry here too, but still. Um, yeah, you guys go there, just go there. Just mop it up. I'm, I'm very surprised that we're actually winning here. Why don't you guys go here, just keep the pressure on them. Keep the pressure on. Oh, hello. Yay, improved American uh, relations. Good, because they're, we're waiting support. Magadan Free Radio, coffee break. In the mess of all the MRF building, two men, the broadcasters of the MRF, sat down for the coffee break. Right now, the electricians were handling the broadcast and mastering the audio and making sure that it all proceeded smoothly in their absence. Along with coffee, they had a toast, a slice of bread, and some jam. Imported from America, the commercial links between Amer the party and America manifested themselves into the cans of Coca-Cola, packs of Lucky Strike, and the powdered coffee that they now drink. So, Sergei said to Vasily, 
Did you hear about the victory out east? And not answered his query. I thought so. I hear the VOD's coming out here in a few days and make some grand speech about the victory or something. He took a sip of his coffee and bite out of his toast. These are good. I hear they're cutting our pay, Vasily said, putting his cup down, while Sergei regarded him. Eyes wide with surprise. It's true. Vasily continued to tell you the truth. I've been expecting it for a while. But the number of electricians and technicians showing up to work these days, he sighed. At least I have savings. What kind of savings, Sergei said, his mouth full of food. This and that, you know. My dad used to be a bodyguard for Rozhevsky. I can find a thing or two here and there throughout the years. Kind of surprised the boss didn't just have you shot. A chuckle. You tell me then again, he said, regarding his friend with a smile. No one would be there to cover for your F-ups, Mr. Sergei of MRF. Suppose that's true, Sergei said, laughing a little. I wouldn't know what to do without you. An unlikely friendship, but a friendship nonetheless. Oh, did we overrun a division? Oh, please say it's so. Nice. Hello there. Overall, not too bad so far. Get some trucks. I just want to get as much equipment as possible. You never know when we might run out. Go here, too. Give him that low oomph. And if we can circle these guys, that'd be great. But we'll see. Krasnoyask is gone. Of course, we have no manpower, but let's go do this. Hey, we got a slightly better manpower back. Man, this guy. This this group is pretty difficult to break. Of course, they're in forest still, but, you know, whatever. Um, what are you guys headed to? I want you to hold there. I want you to go right here. No, you want to hold you first. Hold, 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 hold. Okay, don't hold then. Go right here. Uh, you can't win there either. God dang it. All right, so everyone hold. Stop attacking. Get, get your spots. Let the enemy move themselves. They're coming into there, which is fine. Um, we got a solid... Put up a solid front right there. And you guys are going to go in and snap them that way. If you can. Gotta wish we'd motorized. Um, oh, it's good. Oh, we haven't scavenged for a little while. Yay. And then we have some coffee to keep us nice and warm, though. There you go. Nice. Hold. And I'll support the attack here, both of you. There you go. Pretty easy. Alright, so they have up to six divisions. And we have up to six. We've lost 3,000. They lost 12,000. God, these wars, when no map, are really flipping sucks. A little bit of lag, but whatever. Actually, you know what? Just just in case. Just duplicate them. We're going to call them the G divisions. Uh, we actually have military police. You know what? Don't put a military police on. Just because I don't know if we have enough support equipment. Yep. Maybe later on we will, but for now, don't do that. There we go. Hey, infrastructure reserve is pretty nice. And let's grab this one too. So, we got a plan of attack. And that's going to be probably like here ish. Oh, they're, are they trading out? They're trading out for some reason. Um, I want to make it something we really, really need to attack here. Yeah. Uh, 50, can, if you can still win there. You know what? These guys are still moving around. Let them move back in there. Let them move back in. I don't want to rush it. It's a pretty good attack and defense, though. Pavlov. Okay, there we go. Now do it again. You should be able to win. So we're going to circle these two divisions and kill them all that way. There we go. <clears throat> I'm glad we put the support artillery on these guys, too. That really helps out. Artillery is looking very good. Is it possible for us to throw extra artillery? Oh, yeah. Give them a little more oomph. Might as well. Nice. Get these two divisions and killed off. So they have three divisions over here. Not bad, not bad. Um, they're probably not going to starve too much yet, but... We could probably do that. There you go. You hold first. Keep them up. Yeah, go in there first. Actually, you know what? I want you to hold. You're going to support the attack. You're going to go straight down there. There you go. Got to plan this out. Uh, workers, equipment, equipment. Yes. We need high American support, which sucks, but whatever. Let them go in and circle. We'll destroy this division. And circle, destroy that division. So it just takes time, which is something we don't really have a lot of, but whatever. It's only 63. September 63, so we'll be fine. A German Civil War hasn't fi fired yet, so we'll be okay. I'm, I'm tempted to just convert these guys to motorized. There's going to be so many motorized already. Or so much equipment. Um, is that possible? Yeah? Sort of. We need more guns, though. Because we're out now. So it's definitely sort of. It's a strong sort of. Probably a bad idea to do this now, but whatever. 
going. Give them a little bit of love. Because everyone wants a little bit of love in life. Cool. There you go. There you go. Nice. Very good. Here, come down here too. We have two. Oh, we have two of these divisions. There you go. Oh, did you just give it up? Oh my gosh, you ding-dongs. But, you know what? That could be a lot worse. You know, keep these guys in place. You go in there. And you'll keep those guys in place, too. Oh, they have another division in there, too. Okay. Didn't realize that. It's alright. Go in here. Come on. Yes. 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 Worked out in our favor in the end. Sort of. As long as we don't get in circle here. Oh, that's alright. Get our guys on the line. And get them all in line and we'll push. Ah, yes. American guns. Yes, yes, please, America, please. Even though I thought we got rid of Von Siatsky already, but whatever. More loot. Oh, say, please say so. Um, is that a tile? No, that's just one. Okay, so then. It's kind of hard to see. Oh, man, this sucks. Fighting through here really sucks. Let's go in. Should be... Wow, it's level 5. You got a better attack and better defense already. That's pretty impressive, not gonna lie. The fighting through is gonna suck so much. But whatever. Um, and to get a high command. As has been previously established in the immediate aftermath of the Union's collapse, the monarchists formed a pact with the RFP, creating the anti-Bolshevik Front. The operations were successful up to a point. Eventually, the defense of ground to a halt before the East could be unified, and the members of the Front went their separate ways. So Semenyov took a section of the line near Chita, and the set up camp there, waiting for the day that the Tsar ruled over Russia once again. He would not live to see his efforts fail. Monarchism aside, the officer corps of the Tsars mainly hold the same ideals as Makovsky and the RFP. And these ideologically compatible allies, it would be a great waste to send their talents to the gallows instead. We should integrate them and give them a place alongside us, marching together towards the final liberation of Russia. Perhaps then they will finally see the crowned hand, crowned head. Does not make a does not does not a great Russia make? Yeah, I know they're going to go for there, but that was really awkward. Oh well, whatever. Oh wow, this is. I think I played. I played as Mikoski before. Not Mikoski. Yeah, yeah Mikoski sort of. But like, last time I did this, I remember it was really difficult killing off Cheetah here. We lost 8,000, which is quite a bit, but we cut off 43,000, which is not bad, but still. No room for mistakes. There we go. And they have nowhere to run to, so. Oh, look at all this stuff. Oh, electronics. Oh, yes, industry. Oh, yes. Oh, high relations. Early artillery. Oh, yes. I love America. Oh, America is such a great place. I love it. Good, good, good. Ah, oh, we got him, my friends. We got him. If you're about, like to read about that, please go ahead. Instantly, and prepare against Alden. Maybe actually, who is who is loot? No one. Okay, <laughs> no one has loot. Um, I'm gonna assume Alden. Maybe I don't know, we'll see. Secure control. We have. Oh, see this one. Auto bypass. And we get the high command next. Um, no reunification. No, we're not even close to it yet. Whatever. Methods are. It took him since Mikh Tsar Mikhail's arrival in Russia, perhaps comedic in retrospect. A sign of House Romanov, his father's non-dynastic marriage to his mother made sure that no claim would ever pass to his blood. The Tsar's officers, however, desperate for any claimants to the throne, sent out invitations across the world, an invitation that only Mikhail accepted. Semenyov then detained him against his will, keeping him in a nation that had needed no desired rule. The RP had defeated the Tsars, scattering them in the four winds of the Far East, yet yeah. remaining in the palace of Cheetah's his beloved Tsar, abandoned by his loyal and trusted followers. Mikowski must choose what to do with him, allowing him to live may be the merciful option, yet given how harsh his life up to this point has been. Yet death is the only way to ensure that there will never be any loose ends left, and leaving him alive may not be worth the risk. The Old Front Restored The party has defeated the Tsars and their officer corps now serve Mikowski. The Tsars' fate has been decided with no claim to the throne of Russia under their thumbs, and there is no cause for the monarchists to rebel. Mikowski, however, is a visionary soul. He looks past sins of the Tsars, the rebellion and violent separation for the party. Even the recent war against the monarchists can be forgiven. Let's all work together, like the good times in Habim. The anti-Bolshevik front is reunited. The branches of the RP and Magadan and Amur have reconciled their differences. And the officers of Cheetah have returned to the fold. There will be no more disunity. All who march with Mikovsky shall no longer know themselves as fascists or monarchists, but only the soldiers of the Russian nation, on the quest for the final liberation of the motherland. The Puppet Tsar. 
Is the meal to your liking, Mitkovsky said, or asked, as his hands cut another slice of beef, Mr. Romanov. Sitting across from him was the alleged Tsar, Mikhail. Candlelight illuminated those eyes that a few days ago had seen the muzzle fire of rifles as the RFP stormed the palace where Mikhail ruled. The truth was, despite the regal garb and silverware elegant enough to act as a mirror, Mikhail was no more than a puppet for the old-style white army types. While he waited for the response from this Tsar, Mikovsky put his fork to his mouth. Tasted the ragged, almost done taste of the steak, not good, but well, this is not terrible. Mikhail chewed, swallowed, and set it down his utensils. Before he spoke, <clears throat> he wiped his mouth with a napkin. Taking a glass of wine, he turned it to regard Mikovsky as gaze crisp and calm. It was, Mikhail said, straining to deliver his verdict, an adequate dinner. Mikovsky smiled at him. From what he had heard about the reluctant Tsar, Mikhail was never one to hold back his honesty, for all the legitimacy he lacked. Mikhail had one thing many in the front did not have, from the monarchist to the fascist, a spine. He took a sip, putting his glass down with a silent hand, Mikhail said, Mr. Mikovsky, perhaps you entertain a question from his humble prisoner, this humble prisoner. Speak your mind, Mikovsky said, the dinner practically over at this point. Your Majesty, I realize that my position in Russia has grown rather tenuous. Mikhail gave himself a chuckle. That, that has been well in the first place, but there you go. Leaning back and acting defiance against royal etiquette, he drew a deep, heavy sigh. So what will happen to me now? Mikovsky stared at him, deliberating. This Tsar was a potential danger. Mikhail could be a dangerous contender for power. On the other hand, the monarchists could strain in the RFP. Uh, was wearing away and fast. Soon, no one would take Mikhail's claim seriously, and letting him go into exile far away from Russia might be the prudent and decent decision. Mikovsky opened his mouth to speak. Ooh, what are we going to choose? You will stay here. You'll stay here. You'll go home. I was expecting him to, I guess, not kill him off, but um, honestly, if we keep him here, that's probably a bad idea. But like we said in the focuses, <clears throat> we're not here as fascists or monarchists. We're here as one united group. I want him to go home. I want him to go home. I think he needs to go home. He probably wants to go home. As much as I want to do this one, I'm sending him home. He needs to go home. I'm sorry, man. Exile and sorry. In the fire of the revolution, Bukharin had the royal family shut. They were all threat. They were deemed a rallying symbol for the old order. And the confusion of the Far East. Things had gone differently. Rozhevsky would have had the Tsar shot. For he was a rival, a hated enemy of the new Russian order. A personal insult to the animal that had called himself the Vaz. The two Vaz looked out across the table, a meal finished, and regarding the Tsar. The decision was clear, and the decent thing can be prudent one as well. <clears throat> Mikhail Romanov, you will leave Russia. I trust you know why. He nods slowly, face flickering from disbelief to something like satisfaction or relief. I see. Exile them. The last sentence has murmured softly, perhaps not meant for Mikovsky to hear. Exile, Mikovsky nods sharply, swirling the last of his wine around as he regards the, old, the odd Tsar. You'll leave your homeland and not return to. You'll go to... Australia, was it not? Mikhail nods again with the eyes downcast, fingers drumming on the table for a moment. It was, yes. He looks up to catch Mikovsky's eyes. Thank you, I... He pauses, and Mikovsky knows the s -wild Tsar too well to think about a flowery thanks. You did not have to. No, I didn't. The Vaz allows himself the ghost of a small, but I did. And the relative peace of Magadan, on the long road to Moscow stretching out before him, the Vaz allows himself mercy. The Tsar will soon be in irrelevance, after all, and the new Vaz can be generous. Operation Diamond Back. The Republic of Ikutia was once a formidable foe of ours, stalling the advance of the anti-Bolshevik front with the aid of the Reds and Aldan, eventually pushing us back. They were the straw that broke the camel's back, the old front disintegrated, and the prospect of Russian Union, spearheaded by the forces of the righteous, began to seem impossible. Mikovsky, however, has done the impossible. The front stands again, and before it is an old enemy, this time we shall not fall or fail. We march north. With the Reds in disarray after the Civil War, Yakutia will have no protection against the wrath of the rejuvenated front. What few soldiers the diamond mines of Yakutia can buy, we will overwhelm them. We will throw them against the rocks and shatter. Once they are defeated, the diamonds will be ours. The liberation of Russia will, be, will gain a boon that will aid in its realization again until, Mos until Russians rule over Moscow again. And I apologize for this just because it's 64 and uh, I think the war should be firing. I don't know. We'll see what happens. The all-Russian front. Uh, I'll be honest. Wait, what? Uh... This doesn't seem like I should be firing right now. West, why did this fire? Uh, well, I'll be honest. I have this TNO Second West Russian War installed, so yeah, um, this should not happen, and this might actually screw things up really badly. So let me go ahead and redo a few things off screen to make sure that this stuff doesn't get really, really screwed. Up. Memories. Mikovsky reclined in his seat, smoking a cigar, a luxury in the chaos of Russia. It drew deep from it. It's embers bathing the room in orange light. In one quick gasp, he spelled all of it out letting his lungs bask in the warmth of the fumes and smoke. It had been an excellent day. As a Vaz, he recognized that his work would never cease. But the heights, oh, the heights that he had reached. From the underling of a madman into the head of a new anti-Bolshevik front, he snorted. Life was absurd. Life was good. In front of him was no alcohol, whiskey, or vodka. He was drunk from another substance that he had addicted him since the beginning of his career. Photo albums in black and white as well as in color filled the surface of his desk. From the times of the old RFP and Albin to the first incursion into Siberia, he had it all. Here he was, standing next to Rajevsky and Semenyev. Semyonov, 
There he was, inspecting his troops in the name of his old master, their black uniforms standing in contrast against a frozen background. He was young then, a true believer. A wry and sorrowful smile rose on his lips. If only men did not change, his mind wandered over the photograph, searching in vain for that turn and destiny that would perhaps have preserved their brotherhood. He found none. He drew on a cigar again. His eyes wandered to the dusty, untouched gramophone in the corner of the room. Mikowski stood up from his seat, and the vase left the room. A moment of quiet amid all this chaos. But, uh, basically I replayed everything that we just did, and a couple of comments. Someone said, it was good that we took the local force decision, or the local force focus, so that it improved our combat training or army professionalism earlier, yeah. So yeah, we earlier in the last update we went from discontrolled veterans to widespread cronyism. Eventually we'll probably get to at least political interference, if not professional army, which would be very, very good to do. Um, someone says I should play the Millennium Dawn mod. Eventually, we'll get there. I don't know, we'll see what happens, just because, like, that mod is... I don't know, I don't know everything about it yet, so... Yeah, we'll definitely see about that. And oh, this is glitched. God dang it, this is glitched, isn't it? This is very, very much glitched. I hate it when I tab in and tab out things so quickly. Yeah. Um, uh, we can't exactly see what's going on, which sucks. But and someone says wholesome fascism. Wholesome indeed. Wholesome, wholesome indeed. But after that, Russian corporations. In the absence of any Russian rule over Yakutia in the previous years, the ethnic Yakutsk completed the final act of betrayal against the Russian people. Russians toiled in the depths of their diamond mines that the fruits of their labor belonged to, not to their nation, but to the Republic of Yakutia. Murkowski, disgusted by what he discovered, vows to end this practice all over Yakutia. There's a small problem as to who will manage the mining operations of the part that incorporates Yakut corporations to the state, fortunately. Murkowski has a simple solution to this predicament. Russian corporations shall work in Yakutia. No longer shall Russian labor go to any other nation than their own. The dams of these mines will go towards funding the party in its secret task. With a surplus of funds resulting from the increased trade, we'll be able to draw more to join us and pay for those in our service higher wages. Russians shall rule over uh, Yakutia again. Ooh, tanks. Yeah, so even if we can't see things here, which is really stupid and glitched. Oh, we got manpower. Look at that. Oh, it's probably because we did, uh, you know, course some stuff here, but whatever. Um, this does suck. I guess we can see what's going on, though. They have only a single division, so... It's not that bad. Yeah, it ain't that bad. Cool. Hmm. Nice. And is it fixed? Nope. My apology about that. Um. Yeah, that sucks. I'll fix it in just a little bit. Let's fix this war first. I mean, it's not gonna be that bad. Yeah, this is awkward. Like, it's so weird. Oh wait, we made two more divisions. Nice. And as you can see, we can kind of see our divisions here like this. But yeah, if you tab in and out really fast, sometimes the game gets a little glitched. So we'll get you to you. I'm not. They're out of manpower. They're out of divisions. Pro no, they're probably out of manpower. Um, can we raid anybody? We have to be at peace. So, so yes. Amalon. That'd be good. At peace. So people do have some loot. So we just need to beat the crap out of them. Lessons from Warble. Oh, yeah. We can go. So it's only, that will, um, I just literally talked about. Like going from like local decision. Local force. So we'll go from minimal training to basic training. Which is pretty good actually. Military coup. Night vision of course. Increased American support. Which is pretty good as well. Forward operating bases. Also I did make sure that we did go with... Uh, 20 combo widths, because we have more than enough army XP, so, yeah. These guys are actually 20 combo widths. Not bad. Not bad at all. But let's go and read about, uh, reparations. Oh, there we go. And, go and begin coring it. <clears throat> and, well, yes, very good. All right, everyone, so hopefully this is not fixed. Yay, yeah, it is. Then we're doing lessons from Werbel. If there's one thing that we can say in favor of the mad mercenary Werbel, the man who wants stuff to kill, uh... Vaz Mikowski was that he was competent, most almost fearsomely so. Leading an army of desperate experiences, personalities, and cultures would be a challenge to even a general staff, but Velvel did it alone. Perhaps the Wizard of Whispering Death can still aid us after this unceremonious and violent dismissal after all. From the ex-mercenary captives that we gained during Webble's coup, we can learn how Webble organizes his forces into a coherent, capable fighting force. We should present the mercenaries more lenient terms if they cooperate with us to raise our troops to their standards, using their experience in global wars and applying to the Siberia. The soldiers of Magadan shall become the greatest in the Far East, perhaps in the whole Russia, no army, and Siberia elsewhere shall challenge their superiority. Now, which ones have we not done? Schools are going up by one. Research facilities? Yeah, let's do research facilities. Definitely don't want to suck here, because sucking sucks. Oh, 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 there you go, there you go, there you go. Yeah, I don't want to fight Alexander Man. He's pretty difficult to beat sometimes. I do not like fighting him, but whatever. Arms from a benefactor is next. America, our loyal allies, has given us tremendous aid to us in exchange for fulfilling the reform that we promised back in the days of the Cold War, or Cold Winter. So far, they've kept a, kept a safe distance from us, but supporting the surplus arms, and by not allowing them to become strong, strong enough to break fully from them. Now that they have seen the results of the Vaz, that has 
he has brought to the Far East. Their faith in the regime has increased, and the shipments of supplies have become more significant as of late, with not only surplus arms, but as recent state-of-the-art ones as well. With the diamond mines of Yakutsk under Russian control, the Americans shall not only receive empty promises to pay for their aid, we will begin paying from our pocket for this foreign power, proving that the Russians can finally stand alone on their own two feet. They shall continue to be our benefactors, but we shall distance ourselves until the time that we can break free from all foreign influence and let Russians rule over Russian land. Board operating bases. With the defeat of the Republic of Yakutia, the party has decided that it is in the utmost interest to rest after its most recent war. Our neighbors to the west and north, however, scurry beneath us, scurry, continuing their malicious mission to prevent the reclamation of Russia. Although not under a conflict with any of them, we cannot let the details of our opponent's movements go unexamined. At this juncture, the party cannot let itself be blindsided by any developments in the Far East. To make up for the lack of intelligence on our foes, the boss has approved for the construction of four operating bases in the periphery of our territories. From there, no change shall miss the party's eye in Magadan. Knowing oneself is only half the fight. One to ensure one's total and complete victory, one must understand that the enemy's will. That is the Vaz's desire to achieve flawless, flawless triumph. The fate of the wild Mitch. Today was inspection day. Draped in a black fur coat, McCuskey looked at the ships in the harbor as they brought over supplies and arms from America. He could see his breath stirring in front of him in the white, flaky pieces of air. The port had smelled the same, bearing an odor of brine and rotten flesh, and fish, with a subtle tang of salt above it all. Petlin and Pavlov went up and down the piers with silhouettes dark against a pale, weak morning light. A random thought struck him. They had not found Webo's body, try as he might, with the men spread out across the tundras and forests of Siberia. They could not find him. He sighed and breathed the scent of the sea. Wherever the mercenary was, he did not care. Dead or alive, Werbel was out of his way. He stepped forward and strode onto the docks, somewhere in the world. A soft rock tune played in the background of a tropical cafe. Overlooking a beach, a gruff, balding man sat in the corner reading a newspaper. His cuff, a cup of coffee untouched, he had to settle for his cigarettes. He had fun in some exotic locale recently, and it was a crying shame that it ended. Effing fascists. First they wouldn't pay, and now they kicked him out. What has the world come down to? He shook his head. No, no more honest employers these days, it seemed. He put the papers down. For the first time since the morning, he tasted the coffee. Mud. It was time to look for new places. New horizons. He left some money on the table, accounting for tips, and left the cafe, cigarette to mouth. Where is he going to next? Hopefully come back and we'll read from him, but yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Taking back the past? Nice. I just want to beat people up. I'm feeling pretty good. We got eight divisions of 20 combo, which is not bad. I, like I said earlier, I want some motorized, but at this point, it costs so much to convert these guys, where we can get 40 combo later on. And eventually, I might want to try APCs instead of motorized, but... Uh, 20 combo will settle us for now. Screw it, we're going to go this way. Give us, give us a motorized. We're going to go motorized. Oh, we can actually do that. Nice. Actually, even though I did convert some of our guys to... Actually, I converted all the militia to infantry, so... But if you want to read about the North Wiccans, please go ahead. I played as a divine man of severe before, but someday again, someday. Also, okay, so with the second West Russian war mod, TNO, the second West Russian war mod, um, there's not a whole lot of a lot of the nations. There's only one nation that's full content, and that's Vasily Shushkin's path for Novosibirsk. So I disable the mod for now, and so whenever we reunite Russia, we'll use a mod. It won't have unique content for our country. Eventually, it will. Because the mod developers are actually quite good at, you know, fleshing out all the stories and stuff. So, someday we'll come back and play this campaign again. But, taking a break from the past after we do approve American relations. Yeah, we'll get some tanks. Oh my god, that's so awesome. Taking back the past. These past few months have been a wild ride for the Russian fascist party. One stuck on an icy port in the middle of nowhere. The Vaz has subdued the Tsars and Cheetah in the regional republic of Yakutia. The former, from the former, we have gained the experience and loyalty of the monarchist officers, incorporating them into the anti-Bolshevik front. From the latter, a steady stream of diamonds flows from the port of Magadan to America and beyond, and earnings to revenue beyond compare. The task, however, is not yet done. It would be complacent for us to wait and sit on our medals while the rest of the Far East has not pledged oaths of loyalty to the one true Vaz. The military exercise will continue, and the mining of diamonds will not cease. The Far East is in our hands, waiting to be grasped and claimed, so the Vaz will move forward until all Siberia and then Russia bends their knees to him. Oh, keep getting those guns. Yes, please. Oh, I love it. And the Far East Theater. Our preparations for the coming conflicts in the Far East continue. However, the foes we are to face are different from the ones we have fought so far. These other warlords that dare to contest our rule of the Far East are entirely different adversaries in nature, magnitude, and motivation. Except for Aldan, these claimants are shaped by ideological fanaticism, rather than the mere will to survive in the Russian climate, or Siberian climate. The Reds are to our west, and Baratia and Irkutsk. Some of the general staff want to prioritize them first, seeing as they are our old enemies and hardened by years of war. Some, however, look to the north and see the father as the greatest threat. After all, faith has driven men to commit all things great and terrible. Our last option would be to invade all down while they're weak and claim the gold there for ourselves. Whichever we choose, our course is set. And after we finished our finish in the Far East, we the West shall no glory of the Vaz. Oh, yes, we will. Get some of that already. We love that already, man. Already it up. And eventually we do want to make some... Oh, oh, oh. There's a lot of resources here. Well, maybe a lot, but quite a bit. Taking back the past. Beautiful. Nice. 
Can we raid anybody? Margaret Thatcher was elected. Oh boy. Yeah. Cool. Doesn't really concern us too much. Yeah, this is not too bad. Ma Fascist Magadan, or Magadan. Magadan, probably. It's not that bad, actually. Oh, Kim Robo. Wow, that really sucks for Kim Robo, but whatever. Huh. Bottom guns. Bottom guns. Oh, divine mandate. We're going to do that anyways, yeah. Quite a bit of lag there, I'd say. We might be able to win. We'll see what happens. You know, guys are pretty good, I'd say, overall, but, you know, they're not perfect. Waning American support. Well, I want them jets, son. Oh, any control state needs at least three air bases. Oh. Uh, we can maybe do that. Um, there you go. Yeah, that's not bad. That's pretty good. Give us some more time before we launch an attack. Oh, they went to war with Aldon? I want Aldon. Are you kidding me, man? Oh, it's further down here. Okay. The old enemy. Yeah. Yeah. The old enemy. For all the Russian members of the RFP, the October Revolution was a black stain upon Russia's history as a nation. Abandoning its roots, and Sam fled to the ideals of Marx and Lenin, creating a state whose only purpose was a material gain. Gone was a Russia that could champion the rights of its people, replaced by a wicked country that actively suppressed freedom. Where did all their cruelty lead them? They gathered Russia to its defeat at the hands of the most heinous art enemy. It's no time for us to snuff out the flames of the revolution. The troops shall move like boots over the embers of the reds. When the boss gives the order, they shall stamp these out. No one shall gain from the ashes kindling from which to light the whole of Russia aflame again. We do not care whether or not it is Yagoda or Sablin who we face. The reds have had their chance, and they, they have squandered it. It is time for someone else to lead Russia to her glory. Operation Remnant, they refuse tribute, be it. Operation Sentry, if you want to read that, please go ahead. That's grim reality. But Operation Remnant. Again, Rick Yagoda was once the leader of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. He maintains that his puny little state of Kirkutsk has the most legitimate claim to the succession of the old Union. However, the Vaz do not care about the rumblings of a mad dog of the ancient Soviet government. <clears throat> He is sitting on the Vaz's rightful territory, and therefore he stands on the party's way. Whether or not his case is valid is irrelevant. He shall fall, and the people will be freed from the deceit. We shall break the remnants of our ne nemesis. Our men, the most skilled and elite in the Far East by, sh by far, shall fall on those supposed guardians of the revolution. Their blood shall stain the battlefields of Siberia and wash away the crimes of the shadowy repressive regime. From the soil shall rise a new Russia, led by our Vaz. Now we make our move and may fa favor fortune the bold. Nice. The Far East Theater. Transmission 02, HG Mason, currently stationed in Magadan. Subject to the growing situation in the Far East and overview content. And we're going to save this up for later. Actually, no, we'll do that one first. Following the last uh, report issued, the training of Magadan forces under Mankowski proceeded smoothly. Surplus so arms from the U.S. arsenals and distributed amongst the soldiers have an incredible effect, and the officer training has borne fruit. I can say without hesitation that the Vaz army is the most advanced in the Far Eastern territories. Praise only checked by the old military adage. They still have room to grow. The prospect of the Vaz crusade, a term he insists on to no end, seems bright. Continuing from the last report, the RP and Magadan has defeated the counterparts in Amur. Along this, with this development, they quick, broke the quick the truce they had with the Tsars and Cheetah and toppled the Tsar there. In one fell swoop, Makovsky succeeded in reunifying the old anti Bolshevik front, albeit by force, barring other emergent factions in the area. We're confident in saying that the Vaz currently possesses the strongest forces in the East in terms of personnel and uh, uh, industrial capacity. We, however, feel the need to qualify the series of rapid progress. There remains another significant force in the Far East, the Reds and the hardline RFP. But we remain concerned that the RFP and the U.S. personnel know are the rumors of the Northern Siberians, of a religious leader amassing power among the tribes there. Though the probability of the RFP's victory remains high, we recommend other further and closer inspection of the regional developments. Mason, now, there's still much, of course, to be done. Can you show up and kill them off? Thank you. Raid successful. That's all I wanted, man. Um, if you're wondering about this one, please go ahead. I knew this we wouldn't get this one done, so it's fine. Well, we got 10 divisions, and we got to be fast about this, because Irkutsk is going to be a pain in the fat tuckus, because they're not weak. Especially with the territory that they have, it's not going to be fun fighting this. I think it's fun for you guys. Not a lot of manpower like us, 6 to 10 divisions like us. They do have some of that stuff. Food for hungry? Nice. We need just to go in. I mean, we do have 10 divisions, and they are 20 combat with, so don't get me wrong. That's not bad. That's pretty good for us. That man part, though, we're going to cut this down, though. It's fine. No need for the past. Petland stated the map before him. A dull, unadorned picture shape or roughly drawn borders of the states that competed for dominance in the Russian Far East for now. There were only two significant contenders, with the commies now marked in red and new rejuvenated Russian fascist party in blocks of, or blotches of black and brown. He laid his fingers on the lines that demarked the boundaries between the two mortal enemies. In the dark cold of his office, he could feel the heat rise to his touch as decades of hatred and enmity burned in the front lines. A thud. Petland didn't mind it. It was probably an age stumbling their way through the dark. 
He looked outside the windows of the little room. The night was bright with momentary gaps of darkness as the clouds conspired to keep the light of the full moon for themselves in the coming days. He did not know when. Maybe in a week or a month would be the days of another confrontation, he sighed. If there, oh, if there only was another way. A knock on the door woke him up from his reverie. Coffee, sir, an aide asked. Bringing a tray full of hot black liquid, steam arising from the cups. I thought you wanted some as I made some for the men. Put it at my desk, he said, breathing a sigh of relief. At least it wasn't the Vaz who came to check up on his work. Mind the map. The aide gingerly placed Petlin's cup on the northern edge of the map, its fragrant fumes spreading its way through the room. As he lifted the tray, however, he knocked it over, spilling the coffee. The aide hurriedly drew his handkerchief. But Petlin stopped him. The damage was already done. No amount of wiping would ever clean the map. And the aide withdrew from the room, profusely apologizing all the while as Petlin examined the stain, however. He remembered the rumors from the north of a heretic amassing his forces to the free the Siberians from the tyranny of fascism and communism. While the blot expanded and absorbed mo more and more of the paper, Petlin found his mind wandering. Perhaps this was a gnomon. A sign from the Lord, perhaps? Oh boy. And, uh, revive the aviation industry. Once in the times of the Union, there was a thriving aircraft industry in Irkutsk. The planes that came out of these factories flew in the Great Patriotic War, a fast service to the troubled motherland. After the fall of the Union, these mining factories shut down as the Reds were more concerned about the ideological purity than the unity uh, or utility of such tools of the state. We now possess the region of Irkutsk and the aircraft industry with it. If you only about this, please go ahead. It is time for us to do what the Reds have failed to do. We shall reopen these factories and let the workers from all over the Far East into them. Soon, the anti-Bolshevik front will not only battle its enemies on the ground, but in the sky as well. Against the other powers of Siberia, this might prove to be the decisive edge that will let us triumph over them. When we look towards the West... These plans or planes will serve us as well in crushing any opposition to our rule. Cool. We're pretty much ready to go, so if we can just like win, that'd be great. <laughs> if we just win, that'd be great, you know. Just we just win. Just win. My goal is to hopefully use some of these guys and just mosey on over and just encircle them and then kill them off. Go in. We should be able to do okay, especially with twenty combo with. I mean you would imagine we do well. Um, I don't want you to do that. I want you to get down here. They'll be fine up there, probably. Probably. Uh, go up there. And circle. How many divisions is this? Nice. They're going to war. Those guys, four divisions. If we can circle these four divisions, I would be happy. I would be very happy, I'll be honest. Good. Go, 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 go. You should be getting there very soon. Pop, pop, pop. Oh, hello. Hello. That's not cool. What are you doing there, son? What are you doing? Yes. Jets. Oh, there's two divisions there. Oh, no, not Hadrish. No. Wait, wh 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 where's, your, where's your support? Come on, come on. Nice. You're about to get encircled, you son of a rock suckers. They have so many divisions, too. Yeah, you're literally about to get encircled. Here. Nice. Give them a little bit of revolt. We like that. We like that a lot. Good. Oh, we overran the divisions. Beautiful. Exactly what we wanted to see. You're here. Just help beat the crap out of them. Oh. Here we go. Hey, we overran them. Nice. Yeah, help them out. Help them out. This is going a lot better than I thought it would. Um, uh, move faster. There we go. Yes, trucks. Yes, please. Nice. Help them out. Help them out. This is going a lot better than I thought it would. Holy crap. Yeah. Magadon's not bad. Even though he's in the Far East, it's really not that bad. Oh, we almost got in circle there, too. Go right there. Good. Okay, okay then. We became a Ranger, too. Awesome. Go straight for there. Uh, go in there. Ooh, we can't win there, huh? Keep him in place. Don't let him move. Yes. Just in case. Yeah, that's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Man, I remember Amur was probably one of the most difficult people or nations I've ever played in TNO because of their starting position. It's so bad playing as Amur. I'm going to that. Please go ahead. Goring wins. Nice. Hey, a little bit of manpower too. Look at that. Oh, we got him. Uh, regional integration. Pop him in. So now we got one fat booty fight against these guys. This is one of the few campaigns I feel like in the Far East that we actually have a chance of doing really, really well against uh, Divine Mandate Siberia. Weird. 
the state intelligence agency. After the defeat of uh, the Soviet remnants, uh, the Vaz has taken an interest in the specific state apparatus of the government. The NKVD, the mastermind behind the many crimes of the Union against Russia, was a competent organization capable of maintaining the security of the state. Mikovsky plans to use him as an inspiration for his own intelligence service, but also as a lesson. The crimes against the freedom and liberty of the Russian people shall no longer be tolerated. The vision for, is the impetus for the state intelligence agency, a body consisting of spies, commissars, and secret police, whose task is to investigate and dissent and monitor to the enemy. The party shall merge our separate investigative agencies into this SIA. We'll infiltrate our enemies to the west and the north. They will be unable to move an inch without knowing us. Or without us knowing. The eyes of Mikovsky shall not overlook his own realm either. There will be no more dissent and never another Rodzewski. Never, ever, ever again. Then KVD papers. Dimitri watched as they stacked the papers from Yagoda's office, piles upon piles of flickering white, or faint white pages, weighted down on rocks, so the Siberian wind would not scatter them in all directions. Yagoda himself had either died or disappeared. The Vaz did not care for either, preferably. The Vaz would have had him shot, but they did not will Mikovsky to do so. Dimitri nursed the stump that had once been his arm. He felt it at he still felt it at night, grasping at imaginary objects, gripping the handle of his imagined doors, and brushing against walls that only belonged in his mind. Ivan was out there somewhere. The quiet dude didn't even accept any form of thanks from him. A single grunt, and hands that shooed away any cigarettes, canned food, or money. Dimitri's prosthetic lay beside him on the grass, its sockets yearning for an owner to wield them. Now, now. It had been some time since the doctors amputated his gangrenous, infected arms in a dank, full medical tent. The morphine that provided him now had not been enough, and he still dreaded to think of the night. Turning to see the pile, he saw a guard in RP uniform walk towards it, carrying a can of petroleum. Others carried leaves, branches, and whatever flamb flammable material they could find and smothered the pile with it. The heavy odor of petrol reeked as a guard first opened the can and then poured it on the papers, shuffling away from it, leaving a trail. Then he lit a match, and all of them watched as a fire cut the path fixed for it, and gently set the records ablaze. Dmitri observed the flames burn with this interest. What had it transpired between the Vals and the Russians and the General Secretary of the Soviet Union? He did not care at all. <clears throat> He felt the flames brush his face as its heat intensifying every second. But he sat, massaging his stump, and watched the past crumble to ashes before his eyes. The future is now in the, the gold of Aldan. The gold mines of Aldan are in our hands. The hired guns of mercenaries that once protected the town have dispersed, taking their payment and rifles with them. Honor is perhaps the most valuable resource in the Far East, it seems. The people of Aldan only learned this fact recently, and their identity did not survive the lessons imparted. Aldan, however, is a sparsely populated region. To bring the gold mines up to the full potential, we would need to make or take some measures. The boss shall send some of his labor force to the northern mines of Aldan, using gold to incentivize the settlers to go there. Once up and running, gold will pour out of these mines to finance a war effort brought in from the Far East. With the excess revenue brought in by the war, we can afford a bigger army. However, we should not make the same mistakes that Aldan did. All shall swear loyalty to the boss and him. Oh, there's a cooning, and that sucks. That really does suck. So they have no content now. That sucker he knows. The people's vase. Oh, but first reports. Oh, lad leaned on a tree, using his pencil to scribble out notes. Oh, if you want to be better on this equipment, please go right ahead as well. As he was leaning on the tree, he was scribbling out notes for a report to the Vaz's new state intelligence agency. As a member of the Siberian Rangers, it was perhaps unsurprising that he was handpicked for a field position in the SIA. He had to be careful not to press the paper too harshly against the tree bark, or he would tear the fragile and thin piece of gray paper apart. The notes themselves are simple. At what he'd seen the day, the weather and geographical conditions, as well as the dispositions of the nearby locals. The last part troubled him uh, more than any other. He did not like talking to people. He soon would crawl into the trenches of the enemy, evading mines and barbed wire with machine guns raining fire upon him that then talked to a bumpkin who couldn't even get their dialect right. Still, though, the rugged surface, he managed to write a tiny bit of what he'd seen and heard of the locals. The data was probably insignificant, but he didn't care. He'd done what was asked of him and done it brilliantly. He even talked to one or two of the less obnoxious farmers out there in the wilds. Finishing his writing, he shoved the paper into his pockets and sat down. It was time for a moment of rest. He took out a roughly rolled cigarette and lit it. In the hands of the CIA, SIA. Individual data was useless. Collectively, however, they might be the force to decide the battle. He dragged the cigarette out, letting the smoke cloud and cleanse his mind. After this, Oleg would go into his, uh, the offices of the SIA and tap his report, drawing up conclusions from recommending courses of action for the higher-ups. He'd rather be in the Siberian Ranger still, but maybe his life, this life, was good enough. Thus ran the cogs of Vaz's news eyes and ears. The People's Vaz. With the defeat of the Reds of both wings, we stand with the majority of the territories in the Far East. The ideas of the Soviets now lie dead, extinguished by the flames of war, yet the Vaz recognizes that those ideas, no matter how flawed they were, came from an equitable source. The Reds, although they were our enemies to the end, desire only good for Russia. They That they lay dead, strewn over the fields of Siberia, does not impede their honor, and Mikovsky shall honor them. No longer shall his rule be from top to bottom, commanding everything without a grasp on the average Russian citizen's perspective. He should become the People's Vaz, a leader who rules with the popular consent of the people. In keeping with the wishes of his enemies, Russia shall not know lack ever again. The Russian people workers shall know that the paradise of the proletariat does not dwell in their world, but within their hearts, within their homeland. Great. Just awesome. Operation Heretic. 
other than the Reds, the re other regional contender to power is the father of the North, rallying the native Siberians to his side, and enthralling him with his ideology of anarchism. He has risen. The heretic, manipulating the holy and sacred verses of the Bible to suit his ends, should not remain long, if, for no other reason, we face a father because he stands against all that Russia is, a holy man, perverting the teachings of Christ to a birth a new doomed society. We shall strike the apparition of Satan down from his throne. The faith of the peasant militias and dissidents shall, shall matter little in front of an artillery barrage. We shall charge forward and anointed by the Lord, bearing the lance that strikes the beast of the deceit down. The heavens above bless our vows, else he would not have come this far. Let the Lord decide who he favors on the field of battle. His chosen shall triumph. The vase on the radio. The soldiers of the army sat in there, can't he? Waiting for the steady pace of the staff to serve their food. It was nothing much, given the soil of Siberia, but what was there was enough. Some thick soup and some black bread was at that dinner that night. Usually they would wait in line, and tonight was special. An officer brought a radio to the frontmost table for tonight. The vase was on the airwaves, preparing to deliver an address to the people of the Far East. It was silent, save for the clatter of plates and the slosh of liquid soup as the servers lowered their ladles, or ladles under the dishes. No one touched their food. A wave of patriotic music swept over the barracks. A voice, that of their dear Vaz, Mikhail Mikovsky, spoke, booming and echoing throughout the room. Good evening, the people of Russia, he said. Tomorrow, past midnight, a new age begins. The Reds, long traitors to the virtues of the Russian people, have been defeated. Their armies lay in the field. Their ideologues, party, presidium, the pretensions to legitimacy, all scattered to the four winds. A semblance of a cheer broke out within the ranks, although everything stayed calm. The clattering and the sloshing continued between the spaces of Mikovsky's words. My loyal soldiers, Milton and Marshall, the armed wing of the Russian fascist party, the true heirs or heroes of the proletariat have broken through the darkness that had caged and jailed Russia for so long. A politer of collapse join the clatter and slush. They shall be the vanguard of a new revolution, a revolution not brought on by the necessities of inhumane ideologies, but for a renewal, a rejuvenation, for a new, powerful Russia to take her place once again amongst the nations. The platter of hands, fingers, and palms joined together, a storm that drowned all other noises. A cry here, a cry there, acting as the thunderous rods that broke through the atmosphere. The night was complete to a lively evening, to be sure. But a welcome one, an absolute welcome one. We need more of this stuff, and we need more infantry equipment eventually, too, so. Gotta keep that in mind, but happy 1965, everybody. Happy 1965. Ah, oh, guns, because we're, we're gonna need them. We're definitely gonna need them. So we're gonna be done with that for now. 65, you say? Cool. Looking pretty good. So, we literally have to wait for these guys to finish up, which is weird to think about. But whatever. And then we'll do Protectors of the Faith. Ooh, Bennett. We need to play as Bennett, you know. It's your support. Yeah, I'll probably do this stuff first, and then the Siberian Revolution. Oh, wait, what? What? Novo Sibirsk lost? What? Wow. That sucks, bro. Do you have legacy of the Siberian plan? Because if you don't, that's not going to be that hard to kill them off, probably, hopefully. I say that now, but I'm probably going to regret that and repeat those words later on. Wow. We need more anti-tank, too. Only a thousand guns. Oh my god, can you guys please just win here? I mean, don't get me wrong, I love getting PP. 2.66 is a ton of PP. But still. And actually, since we're here, uh, stop doing that. Just because we're going to have people rise up against us in, behind the scenes, so. And I don't really want to deal with them that much. Um, I'm going to convert you to APCs eventually, anyway, so just do that. Do we actually have any APCs at all? Uh, wait, I might just go ahead and convert them. You know, we have 54. Make, screw it. Do that one. There you go. Now we have no APCs, but whatever. We're, I'll set to work on. The shield broken? Cool. Never know. Oh, South Africa did lose. Holy crap. So, now we have to wait for this. A war with these guys. If you'd like to do about better agriculture methods, please go right ahead. It feels weird that we're waiting for these guys. That usually doesn't happen. Support weapons are nice. Lord's word for all here. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Peasant uprisings. Yeah, that's what. That really flipping sucks. That's really bad. Oh, they're just fine on us now, which is fine. And eh, we only lost by two percent. That's not bad. Not worried about that. Do you guys have? A, oh my gosh, you broke apart. The last fight. The last fight. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Um, hello, Mara Borchenko. That's cool. Oh, you have Legacy of the Sid plan. Cool. Oh, wow, that's pretty bad. Consumer goods. Oh, no, that's not bad. If it's 27%. Actually, that's, is that bad? Ivan Sevastyanov. Right, so at least we're not waiting now. Follow it up with what? 
when the peasants over. We just want to protect the faith and earn the support of the church. The father's substantial numbers still can constitute a significant problem for us, but with our tactics, we are, they, are ins they are surmountable. Yeah, we've not done anything to weaken the primary support that props up the false prophet and his supporters and followers. The father is widely popular among the Siberian tribes, and their faith in him fuels their war effort. We cannot defeat him without the backing of the tribes. We can rectify this immediately. We shall turn our broadcast in the direction of the tribes while distributing free raids amongst the populace. We will send infiltration squads deep into their territory, and we shall give out food and provisions. And they shall thank the generous Vaz for its hospitality. The hearts of mine shall be ours, and without the people to propel them into victory, the devil's apostle shall crumble in her wake. Oh, we should be able to do pretty darn well here, just in case. We're going to send you over here, too. Yeah, that's not bad overall. How many divisions do they have? Up to 10, that's not bad. Why don't you go here? Oh, 27. Oh, but you can still win. Oh, they're only militia. That sucks for you guys. Um, yeah, you guys just kind of hang out here. Let's go there. Win them peasants over. All right, and just kind of hang out. You're literally not going to do anything yet. Church support. The root of the father's strategy of warfare lies in his rhetoric. Plus, with a silver tongue by Satan himself, the bad man has gone up and down in northern Siberia, gathering more and more followers willing to abandon reason and bring forth the devil incarnate upon this world. We're trying our best to stop the Saracen in tracks, but his words have spread like wildfire on the untouched force of Siberian native minds. We should seek help, seek help in defeating the menace once and for all. We should fight fire with fire. The Far Eastern Orthodox Church, although not in close communion with the churches in other parts of Russia, is still a potent ally after all. Oh, well, deceit uh, cannot silence the truth. We shall seek their support, the endorsement of our cause in the terms of faith. They, they shall send out missionaries to bring back these prod, prodigal sons or children back to the fold. We shall take from the devil's weapons and we shall destroy them too. Well, if you remember about that, because we had to, I guess, and then advanced tactics. That would have been nice to get, but whatever. Sins of the Father. The peasants are pleased. The church and its clergy now under our protection that while they have thrown their weight behind us, legitimizing the Vaz mission, in cases where the peasants attempt to wage guerrilla war from the Siberian wilds, we are ready to respond to with our own twists of their doctrines. Little do the peasants little do the peasants know. However, that their beloved father, formerly their par parish, is still alive. The Vaz must decide what to do with them. Letting them loose into Siberia may once again result in the peasants rising and rebelling against their stranglehold in the Far East. For this predicament, we shall excommunicate him and darn his memory forever. It was never a father. It was a disorganized rebellion who rose against Mikoski's rightful rule over the Far East. Those who know the truth shall exist, but none shall ever hear the father's teachings ever again. It's time to assume the truth for our purposes. That was ridiculously easy. Probably one of the easiest times I've ever had to deal with these guys. Uh... Not since you're here. I'll also stay here. And integrate. And we can form these guys, but um, I want to get to the focus tree first. And the Charter of Magadan. The RP's Grey and Crusade has hit a significant milestone. The Far East is now in the Vaz's hands. Rzhevsky is dead and the Tsar is pacified. The Reds are gone. You go to shot and killed Salvin in exile. No one remembers the father and his teachings. And those who do fight upon this gru grueling guerrilla warfare or war in the far reaches of the Russian Far East. No one stands a challenge in mind of the RFP in this Vaz, however, there is still something left to do. To reassure our people of Siberia and the West of our intentions, as well as to curry favor of the Americans, our Vaz has come up with a grand, almost liberal seeming notion the Charter of Magadan. We will outline and implement the rights we promised years ago in the Siberian Bill of Rights. All people of the Far East can rest easy knowing that the RFP shields and guarantees their rights. This is only a taste of what's to come for the rest of Russia. The Life of Judas. Nice. Oh, thanks for paying, guys. Uh, equipment. It was almost evening when Zakhar finished. He sat in his scriptorium, a candle by his side, preparing to, uh, <clears throat> for the inevitable night. The sun hadn't, sun hadn't set yet, but it was best to be ready when it did. His pen scribbled on the creamy, expensive paper that the Vals had brought for him, a generosity that matched the grandiose scale of his commission, the history of the Christianity in the Far East. With each stroke, he struck the thought and memory of how he came under Mikhail Mikowski's service, a story that he, and perhaps only he and God, knew. He gritted his teeth, vowing to carry the tale to his grave. Each man bore a different cross, and, his, and this was his. Not to die in honor, but to live in shame. And his pen halted upon reaching the 50s and 60s. Here, he sighed. For the sake of posterity, perhaps the future would do better, not knowing that crimes done to reach a better age. Aside from the general chaos of Russia, he found himself stumped. Other than obvious and apparent, there was no notable events that had happened in the Far East. He would have had to consult his archives, documents, and books. Perhaps there would be... He would be able to forge a narrative convincing enough, real enough, that there would be none who would question it. He opened the first book, a baptismal record that he had set on the table, and began reading it, leafing through its pages to find and secure the desired truth. Well then, the first few pages, the black bars started to appear. A certain father, whose name was blotted out by thick, messy ink, uh, had uh, baptized hundreds in a village. The name blotted struck out of living memory. Zakhar recognized his handiwork. He had to do it in a hurry. It had been a hard choice, but he could not let the integral history of the mon uh, monastery disappear. Zakhar remembered the father. 
uh, a man who undertook the difficult mission of proselytizing to the tribes in the north. Nobody thought that he would return, yet he did, bringing not peace but the sword. Sakar rode out with him to the south and aided his war council from the beginning to the end. He stepped outside, the weight of warm and bright memories twisted into darkness. The laughter tears seemed to burn in his ears, a ringing sound that wouldn't cease. Then he saw the graves, their silhouettes against dark against the dying sun. Rows upon rows, for miles upon miles, he saw the crosses of his comrades, men and women that they bore in life, and how they carry unto death. Crosses of r rough, hewn wood, unmarked and unmanned, and unnamed. He collapsed to his knees, perhaps today too he would follow to bear this, his, a few, for a few pieces of silver more. A Chot of Magadan. And we're ready to go in. Ready to do do the Lord's work, as some might say. Uh, scavenge for loot. Uh, well, do we have a successful raid? Eh, it's probably best not to do it. We don't want to see any more political power. We're not really wasting it, but still. So good. Karel Nebogotov needs to die. We need to get better poverty, too. Oh, boy. Took stockpile. It's barely going up as well. Five is okay. Even though this is experience base, yeah. From it, nice. Charter Magadam. Petlin watched him, and Koski and the rest of the cabinet took over their seats at the round table on the highest floor of the RFP building. He followed them, sitting right beside Mikoski, a mere ambassador, uh, and lifted to the position of the right-hand man. He was a lifeline between the Americans and the party, after all. A chandelier set the room alight, an unfamiliar set to Petlin's eyes, a cabinet usually met during the day, not at night. Once they were all seated, Mikoski turned to him, mouthing, that's all of them? He gave the balls a nod, and who stood up and coughed, silencing the whispering that had commenced among the ministers. Gentlemen, Mikoski said, I come to you here today with a bold proposal. He tapped his fingers on the table, going around the table counterclockwise. As per the recommendations from our dear friend Nikolai Petlin, he pointed at Petlin as if his, uh, that point needed clarification, who has proposed a radical change, a shift that would perhaps transform the very nature of the party. Arriving at the other end of the table, he stopped for continuing. I understand that many of us here, including me, Petlin, Pavlov, and many others have served the cause of Russia ever since the creation of the party in Havin. Shredding forward, he raised his voice. However, a time to change. The party needs, forgive me for the trite expression, to move on with the times. Returning to the former seat, he said, I propose to do away with the affections of the past. Too, his voice straight away, once before, sitting again, finding purchase. Escape the shadows of Rozhevsky. He raised his head and looked at every man seated in their eyes. We shall sign the chart of Magadan. Petlin, our dear friend, his hands grasped sh Petlin's shoulders. Has kindly written a new constitution for us. He let go before clasping his hands together. I am sure that all of you have read it. Now, before I propose that from today, henceforth, the Russian fascist party is no more. It is now the National Labor Party of Russia. He paused, gauging every man there for, for their worth. All in favor say aye. There was no dissent. I. Uh, National Republican Armed Forces seems pretty good. Opportunities abroad, yeah, that's pretty nice. Form the Recovery Commission, but from the Taiga to the seas. The Far East has unified or united under the rule of one true boss, Mikhail Mikoski. Under his rule, Magadan has secured itself as a major power player in Russia. However, these new lands we conquered are disparate and rather loosely connected, both administratively and politically, comparing to, compared to the rest of the nation. We should endeavor to further consolidate these various new territories in order to bring a real sense of unity to the nation and more effectively stamp out rebel movements, wherever they may arise. We'll make sure the people of our nation know who is truly ruling over them. And let's go ahead and reunify the Siberian National Republic is born. A strange development, my friends. Magadan unifies the Far East? Russia Far East? You betcha. Shit, you betcha. And now we're going to blow a bunch of political power. And I wanted to do that first before we do this one, just because we might get some reduction in uh, coring speed or not. Um, reduction in overextended administration. I'm just going to click on all these guys as a small celebration for what we're doing here. And now we get 0.3 political power every day, which sucks, but whatever. And oh, we'll continue on that side. Spend. Um, don't cut that out. There we go. Actually, you know what? Military spending. If we cut this down. Oh, well, that sucked. Whatever. Well, here we are, my friends. We're ready. Call the Party Congress. As the nation grows and evolves, its political systems and means of governance must grow and evolve as well. A Party Congress is to be called, and the newly created Russian National Labor Party, formerly known as the Russian Fascist Party, is to determine the kinds of reforms and changes to a government's political structure needs to be made. The boss has indicated a willingness to compromise on his ideals in order to secure a more stable and functional state for him to govern over. We should take this into consideration as we endeavor to improve the government. What is this? Form of the Grand Sabor. Oh. By the will of the boss. A Federalist model. One nation and a god. Look towards Washington. A return to Habin. Land of opportunity. The manifesto of national labor. Or from the black shirts. The long arm of the S I A. Um, and then there's expand on the bill. You know what? This is awesome. I love these choices. So, you know, let me know in the comments below. Which way should we go? With between all of these, all these twelve here, let me know what you would like to see us do 
for this campaign. Because whatever we do this campaign, in the future, we'll probably go the opposite way. So let me know what we, we should do here. Anything else regarding that? Nope. Looking pretty good. Oh, we also this one. The American Siberian Trade Act versus Honored Own to Fleet. So, eh, we can't choose that one, though. Which sucks. But since we're here, we're going to need a mighty army. Uh, we're going to need some tanks, too. So, daydreams. Gone with the days of old. The Feos the Tars, the Communists, and yes, even the Feos of Fascism. Or at least, Rajevsky's ill begotten Germophilic version. Mikhail painted over all their troublesome antics with a single big red brush. Yes, the Far Eastern reaches were secure, but it would not be enough. It would never be enough. Magadan had been a poor home for the emigres who had fled there. Sloping for a new place, a new home, a new Russia, and now a step had been taken towards this new dream to think it was all coming within his grasp. But of course, he still had work to do. Control had to be solidified, the Americans had to be sated, and the future had to be secured, but his dream kept coming back to him. A free Russia, different than all that had come before it. A new place, where everyone was better. Everything was better. Everything was calmer. A place where Russians could truly call home, no matter the price that would come in making it. A new hopeful land, peace through order, order through strength. This was the maximum they needed. Strong, firm, uncompromising. Uh, despite all his glances through the forms on his desk, he couldn't get over the thoughts dancing in his head. The future wished for no one back to work. Far North uh, Construction Fund. Well, that's not bad. I like this a lot. Oh, yes. Established Dalstroy. Well, through our great Vaz has brought peace. Though he's brought peace and stability to our lands, there are still many who oppose his rule and would hope to tear everything down we've created. However, given this current political climate, having such dissidents executed wouldn't be ideal. Instead, the FNCF, or Dalstroy, would be created. Publicly, it's a work program to improve infrastructure, construction, and resource extraction. In reality, it will be a series of forced labor camps where the aforementioned political opponents and dissidents will be incarcerated. A truly more civilized way of handling such people, and a fresh coat of paint. We cast off our fascist legacy in order to bring the Far East into the modern era. At least that's what our propaganda mills are spewing. In reality, our boss, Mikowski, still maintains a tight grip over the party. However, one seismic shift in our national politics has taken place since the party congress. The party split into multiple separate wings, with the laborers under Mikowski, the reformists under the foreign minister Nikolai Petlin, and the old guard who have yet to put forward a leader. In time, these factions may even form the basis of a new political party. Um, improve American relations. We might be done with that. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Ah, uh, the party congress. Not bad. Build, build, build. But I think that is where we will end today's episode, my friends. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. Subscribe if you, of course, are new here. Uh, check out my Discord link in the description below if you have not done already. And I will see you tomorrow as we will push forward, build up the Siberian National Republic more, and begin to strike against those west of us to reclaim Russia. Thanks for watching, my friends, and have a great, great, great rest of your day.